Revelation chapter 4 begins uh, the third section of the book of Revelation. It marks the beginning of the final section. And if you will actually keep your thumb there in chapter 4, if you'll recall, recall in chapter 1, Jesus gave us an outline for the entirety of the book of Revelation. He gave to John the outline of this book. And if you haven't underlined this verse uh, yet, I would recommend you do it now because it is a complete outline of the entire book of Revelation. You see it in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. So if you'll look there with me, please, and we'll read it together. And again, John is exiled to the island of Patmos. And the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking to him, revealing things to him about the things that have happened, the things that are, and the things are, that are to come. So look at verse 19. Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place place. Those are the three sections of the book of Revelation. The things which you have seen. That's chapter one, the glorified Jesus Christ. Some also include the gospel of John and John's epistles. That's the things that are. And then the things, oh, that's the things that he has seen. Then the things that are, that's the church age. That's chapters 2 and 3, the seven churches. And if, again, you've missed any of our studies in the book of Revelation, you can uh, listen to any of the archives uh, at calvarycentral.org, um, and you can catch up on, on where we're at in the book of, Revelations, b book of Revelation. But we looked at the seven churches. Those are the things that are. And now as we begin Revelation chapter 4, we are going to look at the things which will take place after this. Now I'll tell you right off the bat, this begins, in my mind, the most difficult part of Revelation to understand. Not because of the symbolism, not because of the dramatic imagery, not because we are dealing with things that have yet to take place, but because it deals with the holiness and the glory of God. It deals with the righteousness of God, His character, something that the carnal mind, the secular mind, cannot understand. See, when we taught through the seven churches, we all related to those seven churches. We understand what it means to lose our affection for Jesus, to be pulled in all kinds of different directions by the different uh, uh, things of this world, the things that are appealing, the things that are, are false lights. We relate to that. We relate to this pull towards license and compromise and worldliness that we saw in the church in Pergamum. We relate to this, this desire to conform to worldly wisdom and worldly systems of thinking. We relate to that. We live in that. We battle that every day because we're human. We understand these outward acts of charity and service with a lack of internal devotion to Jesus Christ. We understand putting on a show, putting on a mask, putting on a face while we're struggling in eternal internally like the church in Sardis. We relate to those things. We understand the battle of our flesh. We live in that space. But now we're beginning a section of scripture that deals with concepts that are again completely foreign to a worldly mind. We're dealing with characteristics of God. Characteristics that are contrary to our fleshly nature. And it's difficult to understand. In fact, it's impossible to understand the nature of God without the Spirit of God revealing, us, revealing to us His nature. It's impossible to see God and His glory without spiritual eyes, the carnal world, the fleshly world cannot understand His glory. Our prayer this morning and going forward must be that of Moses' prayer in the desert. God, show me your glory. 
God, please show me your glory. Help us to see you. It's so easy to fall into a self-centered faith, a faith that begs for the Lord to make us the husband that we're supposed to be. Not that that's a bad prayer at all. Or Lord, please uh, protect my kids. Put, put a hedge of protection. We like that phrase, don't we? Put a hedge of protection around my children. Lord, g- give me that job opportunity that I so desperately need so I can provide for my, my family. Lord, help me to be more courageous. Help me to be more bold about my faith. Help me to be more kind. Help me to be more giving. Help me to uh, deal with my, my anger issues better. Those are all valid prayers, but if in the midst of all of that, we don't beg to see the glory of God, we are missing the most important thing. That's why scripture says, seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added. Because when we see who God is, it changes who we are. It makes us the father that we were designed to be. It it makes us more kind. It makes us more loving. It makes us, uh, uh, we're we're able to practice self-control because we have seen the face of Jesus Christ. We need to be a people who are desperately seeking after the glory of God. But unfortunately, many of us are strangers to Him. And that's what this final section of Revelation is all about. It's about Jesus' return. And when He returns, He returns in all of His glory. And for the born-again believer, that moment is going to be You know what? We don't have words for it. But for many, it'll be a day of horror and grief. For those that have been given the opportunity to give their life to Christ, to believe on Him for salvation, and they rejected Him, when Jesus returns in all of His glory, this will be a day of horror for them. So let's read Revelation chapter 4 and then we'll pray. After these things, after these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he said, And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. A better translation of rainbow would be a halo. The Greek word there is iris. So like a halo around the throne was an appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on these thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there there was a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. And the first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, and the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who sits on the throne and worship Him, who lives forever and ever, Thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor 
and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Lord, as we open your word this morning, we desire to see your glory. Lord, this morning we set our minds on the things above, fantastic things, wonderful things. We set our minds on you and the love that you displayed for us through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. And the work that you've begun in us through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, open our eyes to who you are. Lord, make us men and women that seek after your face above all things. Help us to understand that you are the treasure. You are not the means to treasure. You are not the means to a life abundantly. You are life abundantly. So Lord, help us to hunger and thirst for your righteousness. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the family that we have here at Central. Lord, this is your time. We ask that you'd share your word. Help us to understand, Lord. We love you and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, in verse 1, there's a phrase that's repeated twice. After these things, it's important to understand that John is now being shown future events. Verse 1, again, begins... After these things, after what things? It's the church age. The church age stretches from the day of Pentecost to the day that the church is raptured from this earth. The day that the church is called up, caught away to meet the Lord in the clouds. In the first three chapters of Revelation, the word church appears 19 times. After chapter 3, how many times does it appear? Zero. How many times does it appear? Zero. Why? Because the church is gone. The church is reigning with Jesus Christ in heaven. So that's the moment in time we're looking at here in chapter 4. What John experiences is what the church will, will experience, what you and I will experience when we hear those fateful words from heaven, come up here. Those are the, that's the phrase we should be listening for. Because when Jesus says, come up here, we will be caught up with him in the clouds. We read in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of an archangel. And with the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Why do those words bring comfort? Because after we are caught up in the air with, to be with the Lord in heaven, seven years of tribulation will begin. Now, you may hold a different view. You may uh, be a post-tribber. I think I made that up. But, and that's not a, a, a hill that we're going to die on, but I think there's enough evidence within Scripture that we will be caught up with Jesus in the clouds. This isn't the second coming of Jesus Christ. You realize that, right? When Jesus comes for the second time, he will be coming with judgment upon the earth. He will be riding that white horse with eyes of fire. But here he calls us into the clouds with him. That's important to remember. And again, as Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, take courage, take comfort in these words. And I have a question for you. When Jesus comes in the clouds 
and he says, come up here, will he be talking to you? I mean, really, really think about that for a moment. In a crowd this size, my fear is that there's some of you that these words will not apply to. When Jesus invites us to join him in the clouds, he will not be talking to you. And I'll be quite honest, that breaks my heart. And you may ask, well, then how can I be sure? How can I be sure that when Jesus comes and he says, come up here, that I'm part of that group? I'm part of that, uh, that church that Jesus calls up. How, what do I have to do? What hoops do I have to jump through? Because I think I'm a pretty good person. And I watch the news and I know I'm far better than those guys on the news. So I'm pretty sure that when Jesus comes, I'm deserving. I'm relatively honest. I'm a pretty good parent. I definitely don't steal or kill or any of those awful sins. How do I know for sure that I'm going to be called up with the church? What's the first thing John sees in heaven? He sees a door. And that door is wide open. That door is wide open. It's not a closed door. It's not a door that John has to go up to. And he knocks and this little slit opens up. And they say, what's the password? And John gives them a password and they say, okay, come in. And then he closed the door. No, this door is wide open. And we know what that door represents. In John 10, 7, Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door. I am the door of the sheep. All who ever come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Jesus is the door, and that door right now is wide open. And that door is not your morality. It's not your good works. It's not how you compare with the other people in the world. That door isn't your parents' faith or your grandparents' faith. That door isn't coming to church on Sunday mornings. That door is the person of Jesus Christ, and it is wide open. John 14, verse 1, Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you that. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. And this is one thing that I hope we see very plainly in this text. Jesus loves his church. He cannot wait to bring us home so that we may spend eternity with him. This is a day that he is looking so forward to. And it blows my mind because I am not very lovable. We're just not a very lovable people. We're mean, we're angry, we're hateful, we're prideful. We think about ourselves all the time. But see, Jesus' love isn't conditional. It's not because of who I am or what I've done or what I've accomplished. He is the author and the source of his love. It's not contingent on any other factors. That's why he's the open door. He says, walk through me. I'm, I, want, I want to save you. I don't desire that anyone should perish. I desire that all would come to me and experience eternal life. The enemy, the enemy is the one who wants to steal from you and destroy you and destroy your family and destroy your marriage. Have you bound by addiction and guilt and shame, but I have come to give you life, an abundant life, because I am life. I go and I prepare a place for you, and I'm going to come for you, 
so that where I am now, there you will also be. And where I go, you know. And the way, you know. And Thomas said to him, um, just a quick second. Lord, we don't know. <laughs> Lord, we do not know where you are going or how can we know the way. Jesus, we don't know where you're going and we don't know how to get there. Appreciate the confidence that you have in us, but, but we've missed something along the way. And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and you have seen him. Why did Jesus tell his disciples they know the way? Because they know him. See, there's not a, a secret path. There's not like this crazy American ninja obstacle course that you have to complete. Jesus says, I am the way. It's me. I am the door. I am the path. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But you know what? The world sees this and they struggle with it because it's not inclusive enough in their mind. What do you mean there's only one? And that's what Jesus is saying. Don't get me wrong. The door is wide open, but guess what? There is one door. The door is swung wide open for all that will believe on the name of Jesus Christ to enter through, but there is one door. All roads do not lead, lead to heaven because all roads do not lead to forgiveness. And to enter into heaven, you must experience true and complete forgiveness because heaven is only for perfect people and the only perfect people are those who have been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ the only perfect people are those who have been given the righteousness of Christ we are not perfect on our own but Jesus Christ 100% man 100% God he is perfect, but the world still struggles with this, doesn't? don't they? We like choices. We like options. We want 31 flavors of ice cream. Vanilla and chocolate, that's not enough. Put some Butterfinger and some, some hot fudge in there and some strawberries, and we, we want 31 flavors of ice cream. We want, when we are remodeling the house, we don't want to just paint that room blue. Give me some options. I want baby blue. I want aqua blue. I want, uh, I only know two. I'm a uh, <laughs> dark blue, light blue, ocean blue, sky blue. We need 103 shades of blue because we want choices. Ladies, how many pairs of, you know what? That's not even true anymore. I know some guys that have way more shoes than girls. 30. <laughs> but how many pairs of shoes do we need? But we like options, don't we? We like options. And this world wants 50 doors to heaven. We want 50 ways to be saved. And they ask this question, if Jesus loves us unconditionally, why is the road to salvation so narrow? And I'm not going to lie, because that's what God's word says. It is a narrow path. Few find it. That's a scary verse. It's a narrow path. And few find it, not because it's been hidden, but because of our pride and our rebellion. The world says, if Jesus loves us so unconditionally, why is the road to heaven so narrow? Why is the road to salvation so narrow? If he truly desires all men to be saved, why not give us a few options? What they're really saying is, God hasn't done enough to save me. God hasn't done enough to save humanity from its sins. And I'm sorry, that simply reflects a lack of understanding of God's word and the story of humanity and the story of God's relentless pursuit of his children. Because you can begin back as far as the Garden of Eden, you can see the love and the graciousness of God to create man out of dust and woman out of the rib of man. 
and to give them dominion over all things, to share in his presence, to share in his glory, and just to enjoy him forever. And they rebelled, and they rejected him. And that would have been enough for God to judge humanity and wipe us out of existence. But no, he set them outside of the garden and promised that a son was coming that would crush the heel of the serpent and that would deal with this rebellious heart and this sinful nature. And then this nation of Israel was born. I know I'm cutting out like thousands of years here, but the nation of Israel was born. And he told this nation that he had set apart to represent his holiness, hey, if you You'll be my people, I'll be your God. Serve me, trust me. I'm going to bring you into a land flowing with milk and honey. I want the best for you, I want to bless you. As my people, I want to show all the nations of the world how a father loves his children. And he sends prophets to these people that call the the nation of Israel back to him, back to him. And at best, they ignore these prophets, and at worst, they kill these prophets. And at that moment, it would have been completely justifiable for Jesus to wipe humanity off the face of the earth. But he doesn't. He does exactly as he promised. He sends his only begotten son, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, sends his son, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life, to be the express representation of his love, to be his glory. As it's been said many times, if you want to know who God is, look at the person of Jesus Christ. He is the perfect representation of God. And he came and he served humbly and he loved unconditionally. And our response to that, kill him. Crucify him. Set the murderer free, crucify Jesus Christ. And guys, this is us. This is us crying out, crucify him. It's not just Adam and Eve falling in sin. That's us. That's our nature. It's not just the Israelites falling into uh, slavery and, and bondage because of their disobedience. That's us. It wasn't just the, the Jews and the Gentiles crying out, crucify him. That's us. That's our heart of rebellion. That's our desire to be God over our own lives. So we killed the Son of God. We crucified Him. And at that moment, wouldn't it have been appropriate to wipe humanity off the face of the earth? But no, Jesus rose from the dead. He defeated death. He defeated defeated sin on the cross. And now what is Jesus doing? He's preparing a place for you and me. See, the question is, isn't, why hasn't God done more? The question is, why did God do anything? Why did God provide a way? We don't deserve the door. We don't deserve this door wide open through Jesus Christ. So when people ask you, well, why why is it so exclusive? The answer is, no, that's the wrong question. Why is there a way at all? Why would God be so gracious and loving that he would prepare a way for us to be saved? We don't deserve it. But this is the love of God poured out on his children. All who walk through that door will be forgiven and will become sons and daughters of God. In my prayer this morning, if you have not walked through that door, it's the door of faith, believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He died for your sins, that He desires to forgive you so that you may be with Him in eternity. Walking through that door is believing having a true saving faith in Jesus Christ. I pray that this morning is that morning. So John is caught up in the Spirit. He sees the open door. He walks through that open door. And what does he see next? He sees a throne. And we read that this throne is set 
Or a better translation is it's planted in heaven. You know what that means? That throne isn't going anywhere. It is steadfast. It's immovable because it's the throne of the great I am. It's the throne of the one who is, the one who was, and the one who is to come. It is the throne of the Alpha and Omega. And that throne is not going to move. And that's very different than the thrones of mankind. It is very different than our false gods. You look at the false gods in the Old Testament, you look at Baal, he was on a mobile throne. It was portable because one nation would get defeated and those idols would get stolen away and then they'd be put on their high places and then that nation would get defeated and those idols would be stolen and put on a new place or sometimes the idols would be destroyed and they'd have to be reconstructed. They were always moving and they were always changing just like our idols today, right? We love new things, don't we? Why do we love new things so much? Because the old things haven't satisfied We think, man, if I can just get that job, I will be satisfied. It gives me the salary that I need to get the things that I want. I need that job so I can get that car and get that house and then get that girl. And then once I have all those things, I will be satisfied. And then we get that job. And after a year or two weeks, man, this job stinks. And then we get that car, and what happens? We take it to Walmart, and someone opens the door and bangs it into our car door. And it's not the same anymore, is it? It's just, a, it's just a car payment now. It's a ball and chain. And then we get that house, and for about a week it's fun, and then we got to clean it. And then we got to mow the lawn. And then we got to take care of it. And boy, does that get old. I'm not even going to touch the wife part of it, but <laughs> or husband. Why? Because when we make those things idols, they can't bear the weight of our, our, our idolatry. But what happens when they get old? We don't say, you know what? These things don't satisfy. We just say, you know what? Let's replace them with new things. Let's move the idols. Let's shift them around. Let's recreate them. Let's rebuild them. And We go through this process day after day, year after year. At what point do we finally say, you know what, there's nothing in this world that can truly satisfy. There is one throne, one everlasting throne, and is firmly planted in heaven. And the one who sits on it is the only one that can truly satisfy forever. He is unchanging, and He is immovable. Why not put our faith and our trust in Him? We read that He who sat on this throne was like a a jasper stone. Now, the jasper that we read here is different than our current day jasper. That word has changed over the years. We learn later on in Revelation that the stone that John is referring to that he looks at is actually a clear stone. And then he sees something else that looks like a sardius stone. That's a ruby, a ruby red stone. And then around the throne was this emerald uh, halo. And again, this is one of these areas that there's many, many opinions about what these stones represent and the color of these stones. One one point of view that's pretty convincing deals with the 12 stones that were worn on a high priest's breastplate. And if you get a chance, you can read about this in Exodus chapter 28. But the Lord instructed the nation of Israel to make a breastplate for the high priests. And on this breastplate was 12 individual stones, each stone representing a different tribe of Israel. And on the back of these stones, each stone was different. It was, made, it was a different material. It was, it was a different mineral on each of these stones was engraved one of the tribes of Benjamin, or one of the tribes of Israel. So when you look at these three specific stones, Jasper, that's represented in the Old Testament, 
representative of the tribe of Benjamin. And Benjamin was the last born of Jacob, and the name Benjamin means son of my power. Then you look at the sardius stone, or the ruby, red stone. Ruby represented the tribe of Reuben, the firstborn. Oh, I apologize. Benjamin obviously is the last born of Jacob. Reuben is the firstborn of Jacob. Reuben means behold the son. And then finally, the emerald is represented, represented the tribe of Judah, which, is, which means praise. So you put that together, and you have the first and last son. How, are you, how, how does that make sense? How can a son be the first and the last born son? kind of a, a fun little riddle, isn't it? How can a son be the first and the last born? He's the only one. You got it quicker than I did. Good job. The only, the only begotten son, the first and last son, only begotten, the lion of Judah. He is the son of power. Behold him and praise him forever. And then around this throne were 24 thrones. And on these thrones were 24 elders. What's the obvious question here? When you read that, this single throne planted in heaven forever with the triune God sitting on that throne. And around this throne are 24 other thrones, and 24 elders are sitting on these 24 thrones. What's the obvious question? Who are these people? Who are these elders? Now, there's two real uh, predominant schools of thought. One, they're angelic beings, and the other, they're glorified human beings. But based on how John describes them, I would definitely lean towards glorified humans. And more specifically, the glorified church as a whole. And I'll tell you why. The term elder in scripture never refers to a glor uh, an angelic being. It never refers to an angel. It is someone who has been appointed to care for and to look after a local church. And then what else do we see about these 24 we know that they're called elders. And what are they wearing? They're clothed in white robes. And if you remember in Revelation 3, 5, Jesus said, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. And then he goes on in Revelation 3.18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed. White garments are the attire. It's the dress code of heaven. And throughout Revelation, the redeemed church is described as wearing white robes. That's another reason I believe that this is the glorified church. This is the raptured church. Then we read, what else are they wearing? Crowns of gold. What a perfect song to sing this morning. We bow down. Finish it. We lay our crowns. Actually forgot it for a second, so that helped. Thanks. <laughs> we bow down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. Revelation 3.21, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne, ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. We are promised throughout scripture a number of different throne, uh, crowns, crowns for those who have overcome, crowns for those who have been martyred uh, for their faith, a, a crown of faith. And what do we do with these crowns? Do we wear them? Are we proud of them? If my crown is bigger than your crown, do I make sure you see how fancy my crown is? No. We throw them at the feet of Jesus. We give them back to him. He gave them to us, and it is a gift to us to be able to give it back to him. So where does the number 24 come from? Again, there's a lot of viewpoints on this as well. Some believe that this 
number 24 represents the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. So essentially representing all the Old Testament believers and all the New Testament believers. Others point out that 24 elders were appointed to, by King David to represent the entire Levitical priesthood. But regardless of which viewpoint you as- ascribe to, one thing's for certain, for certain, these 25 elders represent the church. It's amazing. We didn't earn this position, this position of rule and reign. Again, Jesus desires not for us to simply be in heaven, because I I promise you, for any of us just to be a a servant in heaven, just to be a a floor suite in heaven, just to be, you know, whatever, just the, the lowest on the totem pole in the presence of Jesus Christ would be more than enough for any of us. But Jesus says, no, I want you to come and be with me. I want you to rule and reign with me forever. That's amazing. We don't deserve to be in heaven. Yet he invites us to rule with him forever. And those three words we are going to enter in, come up here. Come up here, it's time. Come be with me. And we also see a sea of glass, like crystal. The sea of glass. I believe, again, that this is an actual sea. I don't think the sea itself is made of glass. I think it is a sea that is so still that it looks like glass. It looks like crystal. And Why would that be? From the moment, you know what, even going further back. We are aliens in this world, aren't we? This is not our home. We don't belong here. We are in a a world that is hostile to God. And because they hate God, they hate you and me. Any image of Christ that we display is is a... um, Scripture says it's the scent of death to a dying world. And because of that, throughout all of history, the church has been persecuted. And I know as Americans, we don't fully understand that. And maybe our time is coming to an end as well. But the church has been in turmoil since its inception. Because this is not our home. This world is really essentially run by the ruler of darkness. And he seeks to destroy the church, but Jesus has promised that even the gates of hell won't overcome the church. But we have been a church in turmoil, surrounded by persecution, surrounded by raging seas of men who are antagonistic towards the one true God. Jesus said, they hated me, they will hate you. We read that we should not grow weary in doing good. Jesus promised, in this world you will have trouble. That is the nature of living in this world. But one day we will be called to Jesus' side and that tribulation will stop. The trouble will stop. The persecution will stop. And not just slow down, not just get a little easier. I'm talking a crystal sea. Just as Jesus stepped out of the boat and told the storm, stop, you're done now. And the storm stopped. That Again, this is my, we're talking about some symbolism here, but when I look at that, I see the peace that the church will enter into. And I don't know about you guys, I'm looking forward to that peace. Because not only do we deal with an external struggle, we deal with the struggle that takes place in our minds every day. I'm looking forward to that peace and that calm and that rest and that sea will be still like glass. We also see four living creatures and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time there. But those four living creatures, the four faces, they have been said to represent so many different things. David Guzik writes, 
They've been said to represent the elements or the cardinal virtues or the powers of the human soul or the different churches or the great apostles or the orders of churchmen, the principal angels. I mean, so many different views. But others believe that they simply represent the four Gospels. That the lion represents the Gospel of Matthew, which presents Jesus as king. The calf represents the Gospel of Mark, which presents Jesus as the humble servant and the humble sacrifice. The face of a man represents the Gospel of Mark, which presents the humanity of Jesus Christ. And the flying eagle represents the Gospel of John, which presents the deity of Jesus Christ. I think that's a good fit. But here's what we know for certain. These elders and these living creatures and the sea of glass, they are not the center of attention in heaven. As wonderful as they are, and as beautiful as they are, and how, as glorious as they are, they are not the chief attraction in heaven. Have you ever been in a situation where you noticed everybody else was looking at something? You walk in and everyone's looking up. And you think, well, I should probably look up and see what's going on. The elders and the living creatures have their attention fixed on the one who sits on the throne. And they do not rest day or night saying, Holy, holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever and they cast their crowns before the throne and they say, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Guys, this is what's going on in heaven. This is one of the problems I have with these... uh, uh, heaven experiences. People supposedly die, they go into heaven, they meet with grandma and grandpa, and they come back home and they write a book and they make millions of dollars because of this book. I I don't think when we get to heaven we're going to be like, okay, where's grandpa? Where's grandma? Where's Uncle Tim? I haven't seen him in a while. We are going to see Jesus, and we are going to fall on our faces, and we are going to worship And then we're going to get up to leave, and then we're going to look at him again and say, nope, I'm not leaving yet. And we're going to worship him, and we're going to praise him. And and if we don't understand that, and this is my concern even with myself, when we step into our time of worship, these aren't the warm-up songs before the message. We are practicing what we'll be doing in heaven. And I don't know about you, but sometimes my mind wanders to the strangest things. And the reason my mind wanders is because I don't fully understand the glory of God. I don't fully understand the privilege that I have to step into his throne room and give him worship that he is worthy of. He is worthy of all honor and all praise. And so my my prayer, Lord, show me your glory. Help me to see you more clearly. Because I know the clear, more clearly I see your face, the more clearly I understand Jesus Christ. When I have these opportunities to come and worship with my brothers and sisters, how can I resist giving you glory and praise? Our minds wander because there's so many things for them to wander to. Lord, stir up our affection for you. Another thing that's really important here, I think it's very, it's a, it should be very concerning if we are ever in a space that consists of people who claim to be Christians and Jesus is not the center of that space. What do I mean by that? If there is a church that is centered around the worship team and not, now don't understand this, we can say that We can put in our mission statement that Jesus Christ is king. He is the center of our worship. But then what we do can be very, very different. You know what I mean? So if you are involved in some Christian community 
And anything but Jesus Christ is the center of that. You should be concerned. If there's a a pastor who has elevated himself or the congregation has elevated himself and he is the center of that Christian community that is broken and that's wrong, if the worship team is the center, if there's a program that's the center, if there is a cause that is the center, if you keep hearing this message over and over again, and it's not that Jesus Christ is king and there's salvation in him, but it's some other message like let's, you know what, it doesn't matter what the message is. If it's any other message, be very concerned because we should be seeing heaven here when we gather together be a glimpse of heaven because he is the center and you've heard this said before would we be okay with heaven if we had eternal life no pain no sorrow no sickness no death all the fabulous feasts that were promised all the glory that is in heaven we get little snapshots of it here on earth because we serve a creative God, and I can't even imagine the architecture and the mountains and the hills and the streams and everything God has planned for us in the new heavens and the new earth. But would we be satisfied with that if Jesus was not there? That should be a question we all ask ourselves. Because when we finally see him, we will fall on our faces and we will proclaim, you are worthy, O Lord to receive glory, to receive honor and power for you created all things. And not only did you create all things, it was by your will you created all things. It wasn't someone telling you to create things. You wanted to do this. You created us knowing that we would rebel. And then you paved the way through your son, Jesus Christ. So as we continue through, again, a difficult part of Revelation. Remember, it's not difficult because of the symbolism. Jesus has given us the outline. We are now in the section of Revelation that deals with the things to come. The seven years of tribulation is going to take us through chapter 19. That's not difficult to understand. What will be hard for us is to understand the glory of God, and we need to beg for spiritual guys. God, show us your glory. Help us to understand you, because I know when I see you, I will be changed.